Hello everyone, thank you for joining uh, this webinar. Uh, my name is Maxim, I'm a technical sales representative for the mechanical and electrical division of the Calmex Group. Um, as you can see behind me, we are in our virtual booth, prepared on the occasion of the EV show. Uh, as you might already know, the EV show uh, this year is taking place virtually due to the current situation. Uh, by the way, I hope that uh, everyone is staying safe during these uh, unusual times. Um, so we took this opportunity to create our first webinar for this uh, event. And um, we, for our first webinar, we choose the following topics, which is uh, the basics of selecting e-powertrain components for, small, for the small and medium uh, vehicles. Um, why we took this topic is that uh, as an electrical solution provider, we know very well that it can be a struggle if uh, you want to electrify a vehicle. Uh, you need to ask yourself the right questions at the beginning. Uh, if not, you are going to have uh, issues with your design. Uh, so uh, maybe I can introduce you before we dive into the webinar to our host, uh, which is, uh, who is uh, Mr. Steve Millier. Uh, Steve, thank you uh, for, for hosting this event. Uh, maybe, Steve, you can introduce yourself before we, we start uh, the webinar. Thank you, Maxim. Uh, my name is Steve Minier. I am the Electrification Program Manager for the Mechanical and Electrical Division of Canimex. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, a few words about me. I am an electrical engineer. I graduated in 1998, so a long time ago. Uh, I have many years of experience uh, in both technical and management. Excellent. Uh, so I wish to everyone a good session and see you at the end of the presentation for a quick conclusion. Uh, one important, important thing to note is that uh, you can ask your questions through the chat uh, directly and uh, we will answer those questions at the end of the presentation through a live Q&A session. So do not hesitate and uh, Steve, I'll let you the control so that you can start the webinar. Thank you very much. Okay, so welcome to this webinar about the basics of selecting uh, e-powertrain components for small and medium-sized vehicle. Uh, the program of this presentation is the following. So I'm going to talk about why at the first glance it looks simple to electrify a small vehicle, but in fact it's not. Uh, what to consider for selecting the right components, that's the core of this webinar. Uh, I will use examples to illustrate different situations. I will also talk about motor performance curve and motor efficiency curve. Why it's important to have them uh, in, in, in the selection process. Okay, so um, when we think about electrifying a small or medium sized vehicle, it may look easy. In the material handling industry, they've been doing that for years. Uh, lift trucks and other industrial uh, vehicles are mostly electric already. So why would that be different? Why? not just use the same base and build another type of vehicle. It's not that simple because you have to take into account many aspects of your application. Not only the vehicle itself, but the conditions in which the vehicle will operate. There are many factors to consider and sometimes they are neglected and sometimes completely ignored. Uh, years ago, to start building a small electric vehicle, the question was, what motor power do I need? And today the questions are, what kind of motor should I use, okay? DC or AC? Uh, induction or PMAC? And if it's, it's a PMAC, axial, axial flux or radial flux? Uh, IPM or SPM? And, and also, what should be the axle reduction ratio to optimize the torque and speed? And also the vehicle autonomy? Uh, also, the motor RPM, is this, is this important to consider? How can I optimize all this so the motor operates in its optimal efficiency zone? Uh, also the battery, what type of battery should I install? And what about the controller and the UL approved component and, and the IP ratings also? So, okay, you see that there are many, many options available today and if you are lost and you don't know where to start, then it's completely normal. These are all good questions, okay, but in fact, these are not the questions you should ask first. If you start with this, then it's the wrong way. The answers of these questions will come from other considerations. Before selecting any component, if you want to make the right choice for your, your electric vehicle and have an optimized system, 
you first have to determine what's the purpose of my vehicle. What does my vehicle do? What do I expect from it? Okay, so for this presentation, I'm going to use three examples. Uh, first, a UTV, uh, a low speed vehicle, and an ice resurfacer. Uh, so, um, the, the, each of them can be electrified uh, using a, a, a low voltage. Okay, they all, they all uh, can work with a 20 kilowatt motor. Um, they operate at a voltage something between 48 and 96 volt. So, so similar to what we see for uh, industrial uh, indoor vehicle. But that's about it for the common points, okay? Uh, let's start with the component uh, selection for the electric powertrain. What information do we need? What should we consider, okay? First, uh, well, okay, maybe the vehicle weight and then the desired maximum speed. You see that we don't ask whether if an induction or uh, PMAC motor is a better choice. We look at what are the characteristics and the desired performance of the vehicle. For sure these two factors are not enough, okay? We need more information. So maybe it would be good to add some details like the vehicle payload. So you have two different operating conditions, empty and loaded. Before adding more details to the speed, let's talk about something else. Okay, we have the slope. We have to consider the maximum desired slope. Uh, it's obvious, just compare the UTV and the ice resurfacer and it's easy to understand why it's important. Okay, I do not expect to climb on the top of the mountain with an ice resurfacer. Okay, so here's where we are. We have the weight, empty and loaded. We have the maximum slope, the desired maximum speed, at different conditions, okay? So you see that adding applications requirements gives a more complex equation. However, at the end, it will narrow down the possibilities for an appropriate powertrain. Okay, now let's put numbers. These numbers here are not that important. I would say they are, uh, I think, representative of the reality, but what I want to show is that the more information we have, uh, the more we can differentiate a vehicle from another and be on target with the component selection. You see that the UTV and the LSV can have uh, similar numbers for the weight and slope, even though they are completely different. So the speed matrix here is important. But we could have had different vehicle with similar speed matrix as well. Okay, does that mean they would have the same configuration? No, okay, and in this case, the speed matrix is definitely not the only difference between the UTV and the LSV. We all agree. So we're still missing information. It's a good start. It's a very good one. But what I want to show is that if we take into account only some basic data and it's not enough, we have to go deeper in the analysis. OK, so let's see what information we can add. Uh, we have the acceleration. It's a factor to consider, of course, okay? It's going to have an impact depending if you want to reach the top speed in 1.5 or 5 seconds. But this is not what uh, differentiates our vehicle right now. Uh, we have the surface, okay? Dirt and mud for the UTV, asphalt for the LSV, or maybe concrete. Um, of course, ice for the ice resurfacer. Uh, we also have the tires. They have uh, different tires. So the surface and tires have an impact on the friction. So we definitely have to consider uh, these two factors. Okay, now these are all essential parameters to consider. But the most important factor is still not there. And it is often neglected, okay? It's the duty cycle. The duty cycle is the percentage of time I expect to be at full speed. What percentage of time I expect to be fully loaded on a slope uphill, on a slope downhill, etc. Okay? I can design my vehicle to climb a 25% slope fully loaded, but I don't expect to be in this condition 100% of the time. Okay? Maybe only 5% of the total operation time, operating time. But I think I can be on a 10% slope more often. Okay, this is the duty cycle. I understand why it is, it is neglected. It's not easy to figure out what will be the duty cycle of a vehicle 
when you are in the design phase. But at least start with something, start with an estimate. The duty cycle is the key for optimizing the whole system. I mean, the motor power, the axle reduction ratio, the operation point of the motor, the type of motor. Because we can play with the selection of, of the components to optimize uh, the operation point according to the duty cycle. Not only in a torque slash speed point of view, but also considering the motor efficiency. Also, the duty cycle will allow us to determine the level of damage or, or mechanical stress the powertrain is subject to. We can then predict the lifespan of the powertrain. To show the importance of the duty cycle, here's an example, okay? A same vehicle with a given load spending 20% of the time uphill on a 25% grade could require a bigger powertrain uh, I, and I mean axle motor controller, then if it spent only 5% of the time uphill on the same, uh, uh, same grade, okay? Or we could also decide to go for a smaller powertrain, but the lifespan will be, will be shortened. It's a choice, okay? But if we don't have the duty cycle, we could make a wrong choice. Uh, another reason to use a duty cycle uh, is uh, the, the motor selection. Okay, here's a, a, a torque uh, speed motor curve. We see that the rated torque, the, the, the blue line you see here, um, is around 17, 18 Newton meter. But the motor can go higher than that. It can reach, let's say, 32 for five minutes. And it can even go higher. Of course, it's, it's the same for the power, okay? What limits the motor here is the temperature, the temperature rise. The higher you go in torque, the shorter you can operate. So let's say we are doing a calculation for a given vehicle and the result is it requires uh, 8 kilowatt to climb a hill at a defined speed. Uh, but on level it requires only 5 or less than 5 kilowatt. Then don't use an 8 kilowatt motor because it will be oversized. So too expensive and probably not on its optimal efficiency point. You have to use a motor with the right continuous power that can reach the required intermittent power. And beware of the kilowatt written on the nameplate. It's not always clear what it means exactly. Uh, is this the peak, the five minute, the continuous 60 minute? There is no standard. You have to work with the motor curve. And this is where you begin to think about the type of motor. The peak versus continuous torque is different from one to another. You also have to consider the desired efficiency. Yes, PMAC are more efficient, okay? It's, it, it's an important point to consider. But is efficiency the first criteria for an, for an ice resurfacer? Well, maybe yes, but maybe no, because you use it for 10 minutes, then you can plug it in. For the UTV, however, you don't want to be out of battery in the middle of the forest, okay? So efficiency becomes an important factor. What you see here is a typical efficiency curve for a PMAC motor. Uh, the challenge is to run the motor as much as possible in the optimal area in the center. So you can accept to go further from that zone for intermittent use, but not too often because you're going to affect the battery autonomy. So you see that everything is a question of compromise. What is the appropriate motor power, continuous and peak, um, the RPM, axle to meet all the operation points of the duty cycle while being in an optimal efficiency zone without overheating the motor and without shortening too much the lifespan of the component. It's a kind of, of gymnastic, okay? But it's worth the exercise to optimize the system, especially if you need high efficiency. Uh, for example, if you choose to use a lithium-ion battery to optimize the weight density ratio, and you don't optimize the efficiency of the, the whole powertrain, then it's not consistent. Okay, let's go back to our tree vehicle before wrapping it up. There are also other factors to consider in the equation, okay? Uh, what's the weight distribution? This has an impact. Uh, is the vehicle designed to tow something? It makes a difference, okay? And, and what's the impact also of the weight distribution of the trailer? It has to be considered. Uh, also, you, do you need extra motors other than for the traction? 
for example, a nice resurfacer will need uh, motors to power the accessories like the screw, the chain. Uh, on the LSV, maybe you want to install a dumper or any other utility device. So um, in this case, what type of motor you should use then, okay? It will have an impact on the battery pack selection. So not only the traction motors will have to be considered in the equation, but all the motors. So you see that there are, there are many parameters to consider, not only um, the one that comes to our mind first. And I could extend the list, okay? For example, and, and it's an important one, important one, even if it's not on my slide, um, is this a four-wheel drive vehicle, okay? If so, then the required torque have to be distributed on two axles and then two traction motors working together. So you see that if you wonder first about the type of motor to use, then it's the wrong way. Okay, you first have to analyze your vehicle and determine what you intend to do with the vehicle, what, what you expect from it. That's the key of a good design. And I don't want to go deeper into the details right now. The, the, the goal of this webinar was not to make you expert. It was to make you think about the factors to consider to have an optimized powertrain. It requires complex calculations and engineering analysis to find the optimal solution. You can make a vehicle with a generic axle and, and motor. It may work, it will probably work, but for sure it will not be optimized. And you may encounter performance issues, you may oversize your components, you may obtain poor autonomy from your, from your batteries and, and, and other, uh, other uh, issues. Uh, so that's it. I hope this, this information was useful. I hope you learned something. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, back to you, Maxim. Thank you, Steve, for this presentation. I hope uh, you enjoyed the session today and that you learned uh, a few tips to help you start your electrical projects. Uh, before we dive into our live Q&A session, I would like to take this opportunity to present to you the Canimex Group, so who we are and uh, what we offer. So the, the mechanical and electrical division of the Canimex Group uh, is one of the seven business units of the Canimex Group. We are based in Canada, but we are doing business in more than 70 countries. So we specialize in elaborating and providing electrical solutions for the small and medium of highway vehicles. We help companies to not only make the step towards electrification, but also providing them the most optimized components for their equipment. We offer complete electrical solutions, including transaxles, wheel drives, electric motors, controllers with programming. We have also other accessories such as end throttles and contactors. All the process of uh, selecting e powertrain components, as explained by Steve during this presentation, is done by our engineering team. So we make the process of electrification easy for you. Uh, we will first gather and collect the specifications of your vehicle. We will also discuss with you all the requirements you are, you are asking from your application. Uh, then we will run some necessary calculations to propose you different available options for your equipment. Uh, once a preferred option is chosen, we will handle everything. So now, if you feel the need to get uh, experts' recommendation and to get the most optimized components for your equipment, feel free to contact me directly. We can now maybe start the live Q&A session. And thank you again for joining this webinar.